Well, cool. Well, it may just be us tonight. We uh, we can go ahead and get started, and then we'll let the rest of the crew join, join as they will. What do you guys say? Should we do it? All right. Um, good. All right. So then for tonight, the agenda, mainly we're just going to hit chapter 12 on tidy data. And under the housekeeping reminders, um, a lot of it's the same, but I wanted to call out this part where it says take time to learn the theory. One of these that we've talked about in the past is the tidy data white paper, which is what we're going to talk about today. And then the other one is this, where we've talked in the past about uh, doing the chapter exercises. And I think that these chapter 12 exercises are some of the best that I've come across so far to really get some experience with the tidy tools to help you generate tidy data. Um, and so if you haven't done the chapter 12 exercises, I'd encourage you to go back and do those. Um, to get the to get familiar with them that way. So I had also put in a note on the Slack about everybody's familiarity with tidy data concepts. And I think we're all pretty much at the same place where, where we're familiar with them more or less, but uh, so we don't need to, to start from square one, but um, talking through them and maybe answering some questions and getting more familiar would be helpful. So just to acquaint everybody, with the, the white paper that we're talking about, this was published in uh, 2014, Tidy Data by Hadley Wickham. And I like the way that, that the paper starts where he says, quotes Leo Tolstoy, Leo Tolstoy, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And tidy data sets are all alike, but every messy data set is messy in its own way by Hadley Wickham. So um, we'll, we'll dive into, into what's meant by all of that, of course, as we go through. But I thought I would start also with a quick story about this particular white paper, because I think it's kind of funny. Um, so I, the, the current um, group that I work with right now at work, I joined them about two years ago. And as I joined the group, there was a colleague that I had that was trying to convince our group to start adopting tidy principles with our data. And he was trying to get everybody to read this paper by Hadley Wickham, this tidy data, tidy data paper. And I was familiar enough with like relational database principles. So I was sort of, I sort of knew what this was about, although I didn't know, I didn't know it as tidy data. I certainly hadn't heard of this white paper and I definitely didn't know who Hadley Wickham was at that point. Um, and so we, I get this paper and I start reading it over and I see Hadley Wickham. It's from the Journal of Statistical Software. And I have this vision in my mind of who Hadley Wickham is, is like this old professorial type with a long white beard and wears sweaters and, uh, and everything like that. And so, um, of course, that's not what Hadley Wickham looks like as I became more familiar Later on, um, the, that is not Hadley, this is, this is Hadley. So uh, my apologies to Hadley for, for, the, um, for the impression that I had before I got more familiar with his work, but um, there you go, that's that. And, and interestingly enough, now we're two years later, that colleague that I had met early on has moved on to a different group in the company um, and we're still in our group, still working on trying to implement tidy data principles. And I'm actually in the process right now of writing my own white paper, if you want to call it that, or research paper for the group, trying to put forward some of these, these principles and why we should do them. And I've quoted somewhat extensively from this white paper to try to make those points. So, uh, so anyway, you can always you know, rely on the experts if you need to try to, to convince your teams to do things. All right. So this down here, this part down here is, um, is the abstract of the white paper. And I thought I would just read it because it summarizes everything pretty, pretty well. It says a huge amount of effort is spent cleaning data to get it ready for analysis, but there has been little research on how to make data cleaning as easy and effective as possible. This paper tackles a small but important component of data cleaning, data tidying. Tidy data sets are easy to manipulate, model, and visualize, and have a specific structure. Each variable is a column, each observation is a row, and each type of observational unit is a table. 
This framework makes it easy to tidy messy data sets because only a small set of tools are needed to deal with a wide range of untidy data sets. This structure also makes it easier to develop tidy tools for data analysis, tools that both input and output tiny data sets. The advantages of a consistent data structure and matching tools are demonstrated with a case study free from mundane data manipulation chores. All right. So that introduces us then to the white paper. What we'll do today is talk through some of the concepts of, that are brought up in tidy data and then also um, look at the actual tools from the tidyverse that help you create tidy data in that format, right? So, so the paper starts with, with this layout right here. It just presents some, some toy data, some really simple data where John Smith received, or actually did not receive treatment A, but did receive treatment B and the result was two. Jane Doe received both treatments with results of 16 and 11 and Mary Johnson received both treatments with results of three and one. And uh, the, the paper points out that, that, that this representation of the data is really exactly the same as this representation of the data where the names are across the top and the treatments are down the side. The, everything is just transposed. And so the data is the same, but the layout is different. And it goes on to say that our vocabulary of rows and columns is simply not rich enough to describe why the two tables represent the same data. In addition to appearance, we need a way to describe the underlying semantics or meaning of the values displayed in tables. And I thought that was an interesting way to put it because if we just say, if we know about this data and we just say something is in a row or we just say, a certain value is in a column that's that's meaningless really because you can present the same data in both ways where in one way you're thinking about rows and the other way you're thinking about columns so so saying row or column presupposes a data structure and that this data structure is known to the audience and by definition a messy data data set doesn't have this structure and it's not safe to assume the structure is known and maybe when we're working with our colleagues, we've already moved past some of this messiness. And so we get, we already have some level of tidy data um, that we're talking about together. And so then you can say things like row and row and column because everybody has seen the data set already and it's already assumed a certain structure. But, um, but, but the, the whole concept or the idea of messy data, part of it is that um, it could take any form. And so you can't just talk about rows and columns because that could be anything. All right. So, <clears throat> so the essence of, of the tidy data structure is this. Uh, it says tidy data is a standard way of mapping the meaning of a data set to its structure. A data set is messy or tidy depending on how rows, columns, and tables are matched up with observations, variables, and types. So each variable forms a column each observation forms a row and each, each type of observational unit forms a table. Yeah. So, um, so one thing that sticks out to me is this idea that in a lot of this uh, R for data science book, there's a reference to variables. And I always have to remind myself that that's a, that's a column, that's a column header name. And so, so variables tend to align or they should align with columns. And then each observation forms a row. So every patient or every uh, uh, reading um, with all the different values come into these rows and then taken together uh, is an observation on uniforming a table. And so this tidy version of that table that we were just looking at illustrates this. So, so each, uh, each variable forms a column, person, each and, and treatments, treatment A or treatment B, and then results. Each observation forms a row, and then all together, it's the it's the treatment plan or the the um, the trial, the clinical trial, as uh, as it were. Um, Hadley Wickham mentions the this layout ensures that values of different variables from the same observation are always paired, and so this tidy structure ensures that you have under one observation, it's a person taking a treatment, getting a result. And every row follows that, a person taking a treatment, getting a result. So. Good so far? All right. 
Okay, the, then we go into five common problems with messy data sets. They are column headers or values, not variable names. Multiple variables are stored in one column. Variables are stored in both rows and columns. Multiple types of observational units are stored in the same table and a single observational unit is stored in multiple tables. So looking at common problem number one, column headers are values and not variable names. This is taken from a, um, a data set that compared religion and income brackets. And what's notable about this is that the, the religion is listed down on one side and across the top are the values of a different column that's not present over here but should be. So these would be values of income, which is why in the tidy verse or in the tidy version, um, the religion is repeated once for each income bracket, and then the frequency is, is observed there at the end. All right, so common problem number two is that multiple variables are stored or encoded in one column. <clears throat> so under this messy version, there's a country, there's a year, and then in this column, which is properly named column, um, you can see that there's a letter followed by a series of numbers. And you know, when you're familiar with the data set, you would know that, that, it, that the letter is gonna be either an M or an F for the, the gender of the person or people being observed. And then these numbers refer to their ages, so. 0, 14 means ages 0 to 14. And that's what's shown over here under the tidy version, where, where, where this column is broken out into sex, M and F, and then age brackets as listed there. Okay, easy enough. And then under column, uh, common problem number three, variables are stored in both rows and columns. And so this I thought was an interesting one. This is, uh, I think the, the data is taking temperature measurements throughout the day. So you have the year here and then month. So January of 2010, and then across the top are all the days and they're numbered one through 31. And so to get the temperature, oh, I should say here under the element, this is what's being measured, the maximum temperature and the minimum temperature. And so on January 1st of 2010, there were no measurements taken of either the maximum or the minimum temperature. But here on February 2nd, you can see of 2010, you can see that the maximum temperature was 27.3 and the minimum was 14.4. So there's variables here down the columns. There's also variables here across in these columns as well. And so uh, there's really nothing tidy about this. So this gets converted over into an ID, a date column, uh, where, where these day numbers are transposed down to, to match with the year and the month, and then variables for maximum temperature and minimum temperature. All right. Number four is multiple types of observational units are stored in the same table. I thought this was an interesting version, uh, an interesting um, set, data set uh, as well. So um, in this messy version, it's, it's actually capturing two different types of observational units. One of them is information about the song. So this is like billboard, billboard song um, rankings. So part of the information is about the song. It's the, the year, the artist, how long the track is, the name of the track. And then there's also on the billboard, the week and the ranking for each song. Okay. So importantly, there is, there's two kinds of information that are being captured here. And the way to tidy this is to create two tables. One that captures just the song information, artist, track, and time. And then another one that captures the billboard ranking and the date associated with it. So date and rank. Now you also see that there's an ID that's been added here, one for each, uh, for each song. And then over on this table, there's an individual ID that represents the, the week or the date and the ranking. So, so all of these ones correspond with, with this first song here, with the ID of number one. 
and two corresponds with with number two. So this with this is um, I think a pretty um, interesting way to think about tidy data, and this goes back to some of the uh, the previous normalization concepts that are brought up. And um, it says here that normalization is useful for tidying and eliminating inconsistencies. However, there are a few data an analysis tools that work directly with relational data. So analysis usually also requires denormalization or merging the data sets back into one table. So part of the reason why I put these quotes around messy is because even though, the, even though this is supposedly a uh, a messy and non-tidy version of the table. It's denormalized in such a way that this is probably better for analysis, at least in some ways. Right? So, so it's it maybe it's messy. It doesn't follow the tidy principles, but you may still want it in this format for analysis. Right? All right, and then last common problem number five, a single observational unit is stored in multiple tables. So there was uh, uh, there were some examples given about where data is captured year after year and it exists in tables, separate tables, one for each year. So these are like um, uh, preferred names. This is a name list for male and female names in the year 2018 and then also in the year 2019. And so the fact that these are in different tables makes them messy or makes them not tidy. And, uh, and so to bring them all into the same table would be the way to make these tidy and you, you distinguish them with a new column called year. Okay. Good. All right, so that runs us through the common problems of, uh, of, of messy data. Any thoughts or observations first? Comments, questions? Not really, because you know uh, I learned uh, I learned SQL at the beginner beginning, so I knew that the longer the better, the skinner the better. Mm -hmm. Was our uh, was my philosophy since the beginning to have very long and very skinny. Right. So you kind of go with longer and skinnier, taller and skinnier is uh, is, is yeah that... yeah exactly yeah long skinny but it's just because when I began to work it was a time when you have to save on computer machines stuff like that so it was just SQL and never save twice the same stuff so it's relation so yes so, uh, it's for people for older people it makes more sense because we need to think more about the data mm. before than we have now. Right. So I think there's a generational issue about the, the messiness of the data because, uh, yeah, the, yes, uh, it's what I learned 25 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go. So to add to that, I mean, going back to like common problem number four, you know, I never, you know, I've only been doing joins for about two years now. So because I didn't start with SQL, I started with data sets that were all together. And so talking about that normalization process and then denormalizing it, you know, I always started with denormalized data, but the normalization stuff was stuff that I hadn't touched probably for about, you know, till about, up about two years ago, so. Yeah. yeah, the normalization I think is interesting because you might look at this and think that, um, that okay, it's not tidy, but it's denormalized and that's what I, that's what I need but there could very well be a lot of, of messy, untidy con uh, artifacts within this data set. And so there is still, I think, the value of normalizing it, making it tidy, and then denormalizing it back if, if you have the ability to do that, just as a way to, to clear out any problems that might exist with the, the first version that you have. Okay. Good, anything else, any other thoughts? All right, so then we'll move on into the actual tools that are brought up. And the first one is that, that's mentioned in the book is pivot longer, which I always have to think of as pivot taller. Um, and the description there is uh, that column names are not names of variables, but values of a variable. So you would use this pivot longer when the column names are not names 
of variables, but are values of the variable. And if you load the tidyverse library, there come it comes with a couple of tables that are really just called table one, table two, table three, table four A, and table four B, which where you can uh, explore with some of this stuff. So um, I've also listed out the syntax or a basic syntax there. Of course, you can get the the better syntax from the help. Um, but you see here in table four. Um, that there's countries listed and then across, each column occupies a year and, and it seems that those years should actually be in, a, in their own column. So you would use this pivot longer to put them down into a, into a single column. Um, and so you can see some of that's done here. Uh, one of the arguments in the pivot longer is the columns and you can put that into this, into this C function where you list out the columns that you want um, to become that are currently columns that you want to all put into a single column that you want to pivot. Um, then you also list out the, the names that you of the columns that you create. Okay. So pretty straightforward and easy to practice too. Okay. So I wanted to add something to that, Ryan, real quick too. Yep. Um, with pivot longer on the columns too. So say if you had like a bunch of columns and if you were gonna say this, you know, um, just let me know but you can use like some of the select helper functions. So like you can do like, say you had like, I don't know, 2020 or, you know, from 2000 to 2020, which you can do is you can use like helper functions to do like starts with and then put 20 in it. And then it will pivot. It will take everything that starts with every column name that starts with like a two zero will do that. And so I, I thought that was kind of important to talk about because, you know, you have those helper functions available to you outside of just that C function. Yeah, that's cool. I wasn't going to mention that. So you would put that here in place of the C? Yeah. So, yeah. So if you had like common names or some common element across all of these, this one's kind of hard because you have 1999 and 2000. Yeah. But like if you had like a common element in the actual variable name, you could use those kind of help those select the select function helper functions that are available um, that you know so you don't have to do all of them I don't know if like if you use colon syntax I don't know if that will work either so I don't know I have to play yeah. around with it I think it does now that you mention it um, at the very end of this chapter there's a case study um, and one of the I think one of the solutions to the case study uses that because there's so many columns it's like um, pivot longer parentheses, you know, five colon 65 to capture all of those. So, um, yeah. And a few days ago, it was an interesting question on the Slack that to transpose something, you use pivot longer than pivot wider. It was a, a question a few, few days ago because it's a neater way to transpose and to keep all the naming convention mm -hmm. is uh, uh, is to uh, to do longer and uh, wider uh, uh, to get uh, transposition. Okay, interesting. Hmm. I also came across and I, and I also came across some stuff on Twitter that had like kind of a, a joke for pivot longer and pivot wider. I might what I'll do is I'll pass it along in Slack and then you know you can look at it. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it had like some funny pictures using like a, a sandwich and oh, oh yeah. Do you remember seeing that? That was yeah, I did see it and I was gonna put it in this presentation, but then I forgot. It so. was very time. I'll drop I'll drop it in a in a thread here so everybody can see it. Yeah. That's the yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> yeah, I saved it into my photos on my phone and I've looked at it like if a couple of a couple of days in a row, and every time I've looked at it, I've been like, You're gonna forget to put that in your presentation, aren't you? I did. So, um, all right, cool. So, so that's pivot longer. And then the, the, uh, the inverse of that is pivot wider, which is if you, uh, if you if you have it, uh, as you can see here, um, you want to make separate columns, one for cases and one for pollution, then you would use pivot wider to, to, to move those out like that. And again, these just take some, some practice to get used to, and it, it comes pretty easily. Um, you can use table two for this one. And, uh, and naturally, pivot taller, pivot longer, uh, and pivot wider are, will be really familiar if you're already used to doing pivots, like pivot tables in Excel or some other um, platform like that, too. 
All right. So then moving on to some of the other ones that are really straightforward. One of them is separate. So pulling apart one column into multiple columns. And uh, if you happen to have a situation here where you have a number 745 and then a slash, some kind of separation symbol, and then the, uh, a number like population, you can just use separate to indicate those into, to make those show out into, into different columns. So that one's really, really straightforward. Um, as long as you have a common separator, I think that should be pretty easy, but that's probably also uh, doesn't happen as often as you might think. And then the last one is the opposite, which is to unite where you might take two columns and you want to put them together into one column. And, uh, and the syntax there is to first um, list out the name for the new united column. And then, um, oops, I did it wrong here. It's supposed to say country year. Um, you name for the new column and then you just list out the columns that you want to have united. And it, this uses that dot, dot, dot syntax, which means that you can just list out those columns one right after another with the comma. Uh, I don't even think you need to put it in a C or anything. It's just, you just list them all straight out. And then at the very end, if you, if you wanted to use a separate, a different separator, then you can use the sep argument and indicate where you want that separator to be. The default is the underscore. Um, as you can see it right here, it puts Afghanistan underscore 1999. So, makes sense. Yeah. I'm fixing that column header. There we go. All right, country underscore year. Okay, so those are those are the four tools to cover in this part. Um, I would say that I think the biggest takeaway from this is is the familiarity with tight with tidy data and what it looks like and becoming fluent with tidy data. Um, so maybe just as a an open question, you can talk a little bit about your familiarity with tidy data. How familiar are you? Do you feel like you have good intuition when you see a data set? to know whether it's tidy or not, and, and how did you get to that point? Um, for me, I would say that uh, being familiar with relational database concepts helped a little bit, normalization concepts helped a little bit to, uh, because you know, so, far, so much of relational, relational data centers around primary keys and foreign keys and connecting different tables that way. And so being able to envision a table with a primary key um, I think it gets you to, to some familiarity with tidy data, even if you don't know it by that term. So anyway, just an open question about intuition and fluency with, with tidy, tidy data. Any thoughts or concepts? Oh, anyway, I work with very clean data because I work for marketing. So we have a survey. So everything is clean, but uh, I'm familiar because I have the same background is SQL and I used to work for uh, uh, the National Institute of Statistics in France and we have to merge a lot and to be able to merge we need to have the key mm -hmm. and it was by uh, I did some project about that the key what is the primary key what is the relation tape so yeah. I came in from a world where everything makes sense it's just my background yeah right yeah, um, I think it just takes a lot of practice. Uh, that's that was with me because I, I didn't come from relational databases or anything like that. Like that's what I'm learning right now because I have to do some catch up with that. I, I kind of understand the concepts of primary key and foreign key, but it's still something that trips me up because I'm only, I haven't really worked with a relational database before. And um, it just takes a lot of practice. And I think too, some of the verbs weren't very clear. I think pivot longer and pivot wider. Uh, I think within the only in the last year, those actually came out. They used to be called like spread and gather. I think yeah. is what they used to be called. Yeah. And, and those just didn't make any sense to me. Like I was just like spread and gather. I have no idea what the inputs were and I just struggled with it. But with like pivot longer and pivot wider, it makes so much more sense at least to me anyways. And that's when I actually started to be like, okay, I think I really understand how 
to get this. The other thing that the other thing that kind of really helped me was data visualization. Like, if I want to see the data a certain way, I'm going to have to get it into a tidy format to actually work with ggplot. And so I think it was through like the visualization route that kind of really got me to like hammer down like those specific principles. That's good. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so those are, I think, great takeaways. So being familiar with relational database and then also practicing with visualization, because yeah, like you said, your, your ggplot and other visualization tools are, they're going to air out or they're going to give you incorrect results if it's not based. Um, and also you can think um, in terms of grouping, because the more the data are longer, the more you could group, then after you could compute statistic by grouping. Yeah. So uh, it is exactly what you do in SQL. You have to you, you compute everything, but you need to do what, which group it is. So mm -hmm. you have to have something very long. So after you can compute anything, uh, you just have to, to group to compute. So it makes more sense if you want to get, uh, if you want to get in our case, uh, the, um, uh, the mean of the population by year and by country. So it has to be a group. So we have to have the data long. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the things that I, I mentioned that I was trying to work on this, trying to motivate my, my group at work to work on this. And one of the things that we that we have is we have a situation where you might have a, a shipment. So the row would be a shipment number and then there would be a column for freight charges, another column for fuel charges, another column for you know, if it's duty charges or delivery charges. And, and like you're talking about, I do think that we need to pivot. We need to pivot that longer so that there's a column for charge populated with the values of freight, fuel, duty, delivery, and then the other column would be, you know, charge amount or whatever that shows the, what that what that number is. And so, so yeah, I mean, both of both of what uh, what you guys have offered is really, I think, is great and has helped me as I think about how to, to apply this to things that I'm working on too. So. Um, Okay, good. Then to, we're getting to the end here. The, uh, the next thing that I wanted to bring up was, I can get to it, was the case study that I mentioned a, a little while ago. <clears throat> There's, uh, the World Health Organization publishes the Global Tuberculosis Report each year. And one of the years, or maybe multiple years, I should say, are captured in the, in the um, in the tidyverse, I believe. So even if you just type WHO and then pipe it out to view, then you'll get this data set right here. And what the, what the case study asks you to do is really just take this data set, which is messy, and generate some meaningful output from it. And, uh, and so that's going to be the challenge for us, <laughs> for the three of us, for, for next week. Um, I'm hoping that we can we can all take a crack at this and see what you come up with. And, and the case study itself doesn't specify what you need to do. It doesn't specify any kind of visualization or any um, results, anything like that. Um, what I ended up doing, I, or what, I, what I've got to on the one that I worked on, ended up being a visualization of like the top five countries, I think, something like that. I got to look at it again. But um, but next week, I want to bring that up and show what I was able to come up with for this case study. Um, one thing that, that the case study does bring up, which is important, is these column names and why these column names are so troublesome. And the reason is because there's a lot of information that's encoded into the column headers. And uh, I'll just go through that real quick here. So. Uh, so every column begins with the word new. Apparently, uh, there's other versions of this of this data that starts with old, but in, in everything in this case starts with new. Uh, everything in this data set starts with new. Uh, following that, there's a code for the type of tuberculosis. It's either REL, EP, SN, or SP. You can see in this first example, it's SP. Then that's followed by the patient sex male or female, and then an age group, zero, zero, one, four refers to zero to 14 years and so on. And so there are four columns to begin with of country uh, ISO code with the two digit ISO code or the two letter, and then the three letter ISO code for that country, and then a year. 
And then columns five through 65 are these new underscore SPM014, new uh, SP underscore M1524. Um, and so that's the remainder of those columns out there. And so again, the case study is just saying, take this data and make something meaningful out of it. So I would leave that as a challenge for, for our vast group today um, to give it a try and see what you come up with, see if you can create some kind of visualization or take some, some information out of this messy data set. If nothing else, just turn it into a, into a tidy data set. <clears throat> Uh, especially if you feel you need some practice with tidy data concepts or um, um, or the, the tidy tools as well. So any thoughts or questions on that? I think that's a good exercise. I think that'd be good. Sorry, say it again? Oh, I think, I think that would be a good exercise, yeah, to do that. I know that was one of the problems towards the end of the chapter, which I didn't get to, but I think that'd be a good one. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's more real life probably than the other exercises. So it's something to give a try to. Of course, if you have another project that you're working on, it's, it's all just practice, right? So, so this would be a good one or, uh, or something else that you're working on. Okay. All right, let me see here. Um, got one more slide, I think, which is really just uh, next week. So we'll look at the case study. Um, I'll at least do mine. And if anybody else wants to share, share theirs, they can. Um, I would say maybe we can look at the final result and then you can show the code that walks through how you got to that result and talk through what you did to tidy it up and um, anything like that. And then we'll also cover chapter 13 on relational data. And those are, that's where it gets into the joins and, and different things like that. So um, as we go into chapter 13, maybe what do you guys, how, what's your comfort level with relational data and joins overall, say on a, on a scale from one to five, or maybe, now let me put it back in the Slack. I'll ask again in the Slack. Um, we'll use the same grading system, um, eyes with hearts, smile and uh, dizziness or whatever the other one was. So. Um, I'll put that in the in the Slack and we can get a sense of that. And then talk through the tools of uh, manipulating relational databases. All right. Um, last but not least, getting help. The same resor resources are always there. Um, this call, the Slack, um, encourage everybody always to reach out. Um, of course, the, the community is always very helpful. Um, to answer questions, any questions that you might have. So that's good. All right, last call on tidy data. So I took those, I, I found those uh, pictures and I dropped them in the Slack. Right. Um, it's, I add them to the thread on the reminder for the Zoom meeting. So if anybody wants to take a look at them, cool. they're pretty funny, so. Nice. They made me laugh, which I don't know. That could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on who I'm talking to, I guess. <laughs> That's good. Well, there at least there's left brain and right brain going on, right? So, all right. Very good. Well, I hope you guys have a great week. We'll pick it up again next week, and I'm sure we will uh, we'll talk in the meantime. So everybody have a great night. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.